Good morning, everyone. The Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight will come to order. Welcome to today's hearing entitled Stimulus Oversight, an update on accountability, transparency, and performance. You'll find in front of you packets containing our witnesses, panels, written testimony, biographies, and truth in testimony disclosures. I want to welcome our witnesses here today. Thank you all for being here. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Welcome to the Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee here entitled Stimulus Oversight, an update on accountability, transparency, and performance. This is the subcommittee's third oversight hearing of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. The subcommittee's previous hearings focused on monitoring the development of internal agency controls and reviewing external oversight mechanisms prior to money going out of the door. Now that funding has been obligated and recipients are actually spending the money, it is important for this subcommittee to take a step back and see if we can develop any lessons learned, any best practices, and identify any areas of concern that require additional review. With funding available, for many more months, the agencies, the IGs, the GAO, the Recovery Board, this subcommittee, and the American people will continue to monitor how this money is spent. To put this task into perspective, the stimulus bill contained roughly $787 billion, of which approximately $40 billion was for science-related activities. This accounts for roughly the amount already appro appropriated for that fiscal year essentially doubling the funding. Monitoring this funding is proving to be a daunting task for agencies and watchdogs. As we have seen in recent months, efforts by agencies to conduct the proper due diligence can be challenging for a number of reasons, including external deadlines, insufficient training, or inadequate staffing or funding levels. A lot of attention has been paid to Section 1705 and the Loan Guarantee Program because of Solyndra and Beacon Power. While these certainly garner a lot of press attention, the fact that many of these loan guarantees were made in such a rushed fashion before the deadline makes me believe that we will see a lot more of the same. Separate from the Loan Guarantee Program, issues also exist in other areas like ARPA-E, DO program offices like EERE, and Section 1603 payments. Additionally, potential areas of concern include facility construction at NIST and NSF and shipbuilding efforts at NOAA and NSF. Although there is certainly enough oversight work to go around, I am pleased to hear that a positive theme has developed as well. Funding for basic research at the Department of Energy's Office of Science and NASA appears to be administered quickly and efficiently. This may be because they simply used existing mechanisms to get funding out of the door, accelerated existing work, or funded projects that were previously found to be meritorious. Much of the work done by the IG, IGs, GAO, and the Recovery Board has focused on waste, fraud, abuse, mismanagement, transparency, and accountability, and rightfully so. A lot of the work done on accountability is fo has focused on being able to track where money is going and for what purpose. While this is important, evaluations of accountability should also address whether the intended goals of the Act have been met using specific met metrics. I hope the agencies, the, IGA, the IGs, and GAO, and the Recovery Board can assist Congress in this endeavor as well. Regardless of whether you agree with under Line Act, Congress has an obligation to make sure that if taxpayer money is going to be spent, it is done appropriately. Minimizing waste, fraud, and abuse is a nonpartisan endeavor, and I'm sure we can all agree with that. Now I recognize my ranking member from New York, Mr. Paul Tonko. You're recognized for five minutes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our distinguished witnesses. Uh, you're all busy people, and thank you for sharing your time uh, with us. Public investment in innovative technologies and infrastructure not only creates jobs, 
it lays the foundation for further private sector job creation. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act made a significant difference in stopping the precipitous loss of nearly 800,000 jobs per month that occurred prior to its enactment. Without the Recovery Act, millions more Americans would be facing unemployment, and we would indeed be months further behind in the admittedly sluggish economic recovery. According to the Congressional Budget Office's August 2011 report, the Recovery Act increased real GDP by 0.8 percent uh, to 2.5 percent, and it increased the number of full-time equivalent jobs by between 1.4 million and 4 million compared to no Recovery Act effort for the second quarter of calendar year 2011. That is positive news, but the American economy is not out of danger yet. Economic growth is still weak, and job creation is still far below what is required to provide employment for all who need a job. Recovery Act funding was significant, but it is not realistic to expect some $840 billion to compensate for the loss of over $10 trillion worth in wealth that we experienced at the end of 2008. Because of the huge disparity in these figures, it is imperative that Recovery Act dollars be spent efficiently and effectively. That is why we are here today. I have several concerns about the Recovery Act funds, and I hope our witnesses can shed some light on these matters. First, it looks as if too much of the money has still not been invested. Federal agencies have distributed it, yet it uh, remains uncommitted by the recipients. We need to create at least 7 million jobs to get back to full employment. If these funds are not being spent, they cannot fuel the job creation that we need. I am looking for a solution. We all are looking for a solution. And I hope that our witnesses today have some advice about how to get that uncommitted money moving to create more jobs and to fuel a more robust level of economic growth. Second, I worry about the size of public exposure in some of the loan programs that are operated at the Department of Energy. Grants and contracts that lead to direct expenditures carry with them risks limited by the value of the award, risks that can be minimized through sound management by experienced staff, and DOE has a long history of managing grants and contracts. In contrast, the Department of Energy's loan guarantee uh, program is relatively new. Loan guarantees are for much greater amounts of money than an average grant or contract and therefore carry billions of dollars in risk. DOE's relative lack of experience with this authority and limited experience with assessing market conditions and commercial risks should increase our scrutiny of awards provided under this program. All investments carry some risks and we should be willing to take them where there is opportunity for significant benefits or advances but the Department should do all it can to ensure these awards will result in successful outcomes. While the press is focused on the loan to the solar company Solyndra, the fact is that other DOE loans may be just as risky. Particularly in the nuclear sector, taxpayers' financial exposure dwarfs that of the Solyndra loan. Just one of these nuclear energy loans is 16 times the size of the award made to Solyndra. Markets can shift against these mega projects just as easily as they shifted against the far more modest solar project that went bankrupt. I hope that the Department is taking steps to reevaluate the size of its commitments in the loan guarantee program and the challenges that face those investments. Finally, I look forward to hearing whether there are meaningful lessons about managing the public's money that should be applied to all federal spending based on the experiences of our Recovery Act. The effort to bring an unprecedented level of transparency to spending may suggest new expectations for all governments, uh, all government funding rather, in the future. We do not want to cripple agencies in their ability to make awards and manage them through burdensome requirements, nor do we want to discourage companies and individuals from working with our government. If we can build on the best of the Recovery Act's lessons, it would make our government more accountable and transparent to the public. Mr. Chair, I believe you have brought the right people before us today to address these issues, and I look forward to their testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tonka. I appreciate the accolades. Uh, <laughs> that's the nice thing about this committee. We are working in a bipartisan manner. 
If there are members who wish to sub submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our panel of witnesses. First is Mr. Frank Rusco, the Director of Natural Resources and the Environment Team at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Mr. Michael Wood, the Executive Director of the Recovery, Accountability, and Transparency Board. The Honorable Gregory H. Friedman, the Inspector General of the U.S. Department of Energy. The Honorable Todd Zinser, the Inspector General of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Ms. Allison Lerner, the Inspector General of the National Science, Science Foundation. And finally, Ms. Gail Robinson, the Deputy Inspector General of NASA. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each. If you would, please try to contain your remarks to that five minutes. After which, the members of the committee will each have five minutes to ask questions. Your written testimony will be included in the record of the hearing. And it is the practice of this subcommittee on investigations and oversight to receive testimony under oath. Do any of you have any objections to taking an oath? Let the record reflect that all witnesses shook their head from side to side, indicating in a common way that they do not have an objection. Also, you may be represented by counsel. Do any of you have counsel here today? Mr. Wood? Okay. Well, um, Mr. Zen uh, Honorable Zenzer, do you have, no, Ms. Werner? I have an attorney with me. Okay. No. No, okay. Let the record reflect that all except for Ms. Lerner and Mr. Wood have uh, no counsel and that those two individuals do indeed. If all of you would now please stand and raise your right hand. Do you sw solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and, no and nothing but, but the truth, so help you God? Everybody? Okay. I didn't hear the female voices. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Let the record reflect that all the witnesses participated have taken the oath. Uh, I now recognize our first witness, Mr. Rusco. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Tonko, and members of the committee, I'm pleased to be here today along with my colleagues in the oversight community to discuss GAO's oversight of Recovery Act spending on science-related programs. This year, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that the Recovery Act's combined spending and tax provisions would cost approximately $840 billion. More than $40 billion was targeted for science-related programs, and the bulk of that went to DOE. In March 2009, GAO testified before this committee about GAO's approach to conducting Recovery Act oversight, and we highlighted several research and development programs that deserved special attention from the relevant inspectors general. Under the Recovery Act, GAO was tasked with the responsibility to conduct bimonthly reviews and other reports on the use of Recovery Act funds. And we have so far, uh, well, including this testimony, issued 132 uh, reports and testimonies on Recovery Act uh, related issues. My statement today will provide a brief update of the science related funds that have been obligated and spent by DOE, Commerce, NASA, and NSF. I will also provide several examples of the kinds of challenges that science-related programs faced in implementing the goals of the Recovery Act. According to agency officials, the majority of science-related Recovery Act funding has been obligated. Specifically, as of September 30, 2011, DOE had obligated about 98 percent of its $35 billion. DOE reported that it had spent about $19 billion, or 54% of this funding. Commerce received $1.4 billion in science-related funding, obligated almost all of it, and had spent about $900 million, or 64%. NASA received $1 billion, obligated it all, and had spent 95%. And lastly, NSF received $3 billion, obligated it all, and had spent about 46% as of September 30th. All the programs we audited in the course of our Recovery Act work faced challenges, especially in the early months. 
For example, DOE's weatherization program received almost $5 billion, a 20-fold increase over the program's typical annual appropriation. The weatherization program faced problems adjusting to this greatly increased scale of funding. Specifically, it took the program time to issue guidance and force recipient states and territories to establish market wages for weatherization workers, as required under the Davis-Bacon Act. This delayed the first large dispersal of funds to states and territories. DOE, the states and territories also faced challenges in scaling up the workforce and providing training for workers new to the weatherization work. In some cases, the Recovery Act represented the first time a program received funding. For example, EERE's Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program, which received $3.2 billion in Recovery Act funds, was essentially starting from scratch, and some of the challenges it faced reflected this. Specifically, we found in our April 2011 report that the EECBG program was not always collecting needed information from recipients to verify that these recipients were in compliance with federal oversight and reporting requirements. This program also faced challenges in measuring the outcomes of EECBG funding, including measures of reduced energy use. DOE has also wrestled with calculating and reporting jobs created, a requirement of the Recovery Act. For example, DOE's Environmental Management Office, which received almost $6 billion in Recovery Act funding, has publicly reported three vastly different job creation figures, ranging from 5,700 to 20,200 jobs, depending on what methodology was used. Measuring job creation is inherently difficult from a methodological perspective because it is not possible to observe what would have happened in the absence of the Recovery Act. However, environmental management was initially unable to follow Recovery Act requirements and OMB guidance for reporting job creation, and it is still unclear if DOE has fixed this problem. Overall, the science-related programs we have audited have responded, at least partially, to the challenges we identified. These programs have implemented some of our recommendations and have improved in their ability to monitor the use of Recovery Act money. GAO continues to conduct oversight of science-related programs that received Recovery Act fund funding. Within the next several months, we will issue reports on DOE's loan guarantee, weatherization, and RPE programs. We also have ongoing evaluations of federal renewable energy initiatives and of R&D efforts in the areas of solar energy, and battery storage technologies. This concludes my statement. I will be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Esco. Now, Mr. Wood, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. As the Executive Director of the Recovery, Accountability, and Transparency Board, I'd be speaking to you about uh, the, our role in ensuring the transparency and accountability of uh, the recovery funds and also activities that are underway to extend lessons learned by the recovery board to all federal spending. As you know, the recovery board was created in 2009 as part of the Recovery Act. Uh, it's composed of inspectors general, two of whom appear beside me today, Gregory Friedman and Todd Zinzer. <coughs> uh, the primary mission of the board is twofold. First, to provide transparency for the funds that were expended and second, to uh, prevent or detect waste, fraud, and abuse uh, for the recovery money. The Recovery Board achieves transparency of Recovery Act spending through reporting on the use of funds. Specifically, uh, Recovery Act requires uh, recipients of recovery funds to report on how they're using those funds and require agencies to report on spending as well. Every quarter, recipients of recovery funds must report centrally into the Board's reporting website federalreporting.gov. In addition, on a weekly basis, agencies provide financial and activity reports, which includes the amounts awarded and paid out. Um, Recovery.gov uh, is a website that was developed to provide transparency for the uh, spending that was occurring. Uh, it's an attractive award-winning website. It has essentially a complex technological infrastructure, but it allows us to uh, very quickly display quality control data um, in unique ways to achieve unprecedented levels of transparency. FederalReporting.gov and Recovery.gov allow a continuing quality assurance process that involves the agencies, the Recovery Board, the Office of Management and Budget, and recipients. 
innovative mapping on our website, recovery.gov, allows us to display data with an unprecedented level of transparency, including uh, the ability to search by zip code to see so citizens can see what uh, projects are occurring in their local community. Uh, you can also search by congressional district to see uh, what's happening in, in individual congressional districts. In addition to ensuring the transparency of tax dollars, the Recovery Board also conducts and coordinates oversight of recovery funds to prevent uh, and detect fraud, waste, and mismanagement of those funds. The Recovery Board's accountability staff uses a suite of analytical tools in our Recovery Operations Center, or ROC, to find indicators of fraud among recovery recipients and subrecipients. The Recovery Board's work in promoting transparency and accountability has garnered much positive attention. On June 13th of this year, both the executive and legislative branches took extraordinary measures to extend the work of the Recovery Board to the rest of the federal government. The President issued an executive order calling for the creation of a new Government Accountability and Transparency Board, or GAP Board, which is tasked with building on the lessons learned from the successful implementation of the Recovery Act and working with the Recovery Board to apply those approaches developed by the Board across government spending. And in Congress, Congressman Darrell Issa and Senator Mark Warner have both introduced legislation that, among other things, would create a new federal agency, the Federal Accountability and Spending Transparency, or FAST Board, to provide accountability and transparency for all contracts, grants, and loans funded with federal dollars. We look forward to working with these officials and other stakeholders to ensure that work of the Recovery Board can serve as a template for tracking all government spending. Even before the creation of the GAP Board and the pending legislation, the Recovery Board devoted time to enumerating our lessons learned and our experiences with transparency and accountability. One of the key lessons learned over the past two years has been transparency drives accountability. The Board's accountability and transparency tools comprise two halves of the same fraud detection operation, um, reinforcing and enhancing each other. Accountability works best when you have transparency. Transparency works best when you have accountability. A related lesson is that the interrelated transparency and accountability tools are so useful from both the program and oversight perspective that agencies in the IG community should have equal access to the, both these pieces. While both pieces can clearly assist the investigatory and auditing functions of the IGs, the accountability and transparency data can also help agencies improve agency functions and administration. Typically, when the goal of an initiative is fraud detection, IGs come to the table with a great deal of enthusiasm, while agencies appear less motivated. One valuable lesson we've learned is that the common goal is fraud prevention. Agencies and IGs are equally enthusiastic, and a remarkable collaborative effort takes place between the two. As a result of this lesson learned, the Recovery Board is piloting fraud prevention tools with agency personnel as well as with IGs. We believe this program called federalaccountability.gov will assist agencies in performing their own risk evaluations for those seeking recovery funds, just as it help of enforcement officials conduct reviews of recovery funds in order to prevent and detect waste, fraud, and abuse. Another lesson has been the tremendous inefficiencies caused by the government's lack of a uniform award ID. Uh, currently, there is no requirement that awards be um, uh, standardized across government, and we are working towards this goal. Finally, rather than dismantle the board's dual websites or systems established by the ROC, these three critical components can be, uh, the board feels that can be combined into a universal one-stop shop applied more broadly across the whole spectrum of federal spending. Such a model is actually put forth by the Data Act legislation. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will submit my uh, full testimony for the record, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Friedman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to you and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today in response to your request on the work of the Office of Inspector General concerning the Department of Energy's activities under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Uh, not to be outdone by at least two of my colleagues, I should point out in response to your earlier question that my attorney is here with me today, but I do not expect to have him uh, testify unless I collapse uh, in place. But I do want to clarify in my response to your earlier question. The record rule will reflect that. Thank, Thank you. you. As you know, the intent of the Recovery Act was to quickly stimulate the economy, create jobs, and transform the Department's mission while fostering an unprecedented level of accountability and transparency. 
The Department received over $35 billion in Recovery Act funding for various initiatives, eclipsing its normal annual budget of approximately $26 billion. The Department's implementation of the Recovery Act has been a priority for my office. I have testified on several occasions as to the Department's progress, including before this subcommittee in March of 2009. Most recently, on this November 2, 2011, I testified before the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reforms Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs, Stimulus Oversight and Government Spending. Since enactment, since enactment, my office has issued 70 reports covering all major program activities, initiated a number of Recovery Act-related criminal investigations, and conducted 300 fraud awareness briefings for nearly 16,000 federal, contractor, state, and other officials. As I have previously testified, while there, has been a, while there has been significant progress, the Department's efforts to use Recovery Act funds to stimulate the economy has been more challenging than many had originally envisioned. We found that the Department's programs required extensive advanced planning, organizational enhancements, and additional staffing and training at federal, state, and local levels. A fairly consistent pattern of delays existed in the pace at which funds have been spent by grant and other recipients. According to the Department's records, as of November 18th of 2011, about 43 percent of its Recovery Act funds had not been spent largely by recipients such as state and local governments. In addition, our reviews have identified performance issues that affected the Department's ability to meet its Recovery Act goals. Specific examples are provided in my full testimony. In contrast, we found that, that the Department's Office of Science and its laboratory system generally complied with Recovery Act requirements, expended funds in a timely manner, and employed sound project management practices. The Office of Science received approximately $1.6 billion in Recovery Act funds, most, most of which were used to accelerate ongoing work by purchasing equipment and completing construction projects, projects which had already uh, begun. The Recovery Act established challenging goals. There was what we considered to be an intense effort to implement and execute the various aspects of the Department's responsibilities. These efforts notwithstanding, we had a number of observations about the Department's implementation and execution of the Recovery Act. These observations, which I have described in prior testimony, include the following. First, the pressure of achieving expeditious program implementation and execution placed an enormous strain on the Department's personnel and infrastructure. Second, dealing with a diverse and complex set of departmental stakeholders, complicated Recovery Act startup and administration. Third, in general, the concept of shovel-ready projects was not realized. Fourth, federal, state, and local government infrastructures were, simply put, overwhelmed. In several states, the very personnel who were charged with implementing the Recovery Act's provisions had been furloughed due to local economic conditions. Fifth, the pace of actual expenditures was significantly slowed because of the time needed to understand and address specific requirements of the Recovery Act. And sixth, recipients expressed their concern with what they perceived to be or they described to us as overly complex and burdensome reporting requirements. In summary, a combination of massive funding, high expectations, and inadequate infrastructure resulted at times in less than optimal performance. Given the significant amount of Recovery Act funds that remain to be spent, we have reviews planned in a number of high-risk areas. Additionally, we have identified a series of cost reduction and efficiency enhancement actions for consideration by Department Management. These are provided in our recently issued report on management challenges at the Department of Energy. Finally, we are drafting a summary report to highlight other lessons learned and best practices related to the Recovery Act in the areas of risk management, financial management, accounting and reporting, human capital management, regulatory compliance, and delivery of public services. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement, and I look forward to your questions and those of the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Um, now I recognize Mr. Zenzer for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Brown, uh, Ranking Member Tonko, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about our oversight of the Department of Commerce, Science, Technology, and other programs funded through the Recovery Act. I would like to summarize my testimony by updating the subcommittee on the status of commerce's spending of recovery funds and informing the subcommittee of the most significant challenges remaining for commerce with respect to the Recovery Act. The Act appropriated $7.9 billion to five commerce agencies in the OIG as a result of approximately $1.1 billion in rescissions and transfers that amount was reduced to $6.8 billion, almost all of which has been obligated. 
approximately $2.9 billion, or 40 percent of those obligations, has been spent. The 2010 decennial census and the coupon program that NTIA administered as part of the nation's transition to digital TV accounts for $1.3 billion spent so far. In all, the Department awarded 467 grants and issued 433 contracts under the Recovery Act. As of September 30, 2011, nearly $4 billion for Recovery Act programs and operations at commerce agencies had not yet been dispersed, including $2.8 billion for infrastructure grants under NTIA's Broadband Technology Opportunities Program, or BTOP, $300 million for NIST construction of research facilities and their science and technical research programs, and $125 million for NOAA procurement, acquisition, and construction projects. By far, BTOP remains the most significant Recovery Act challenge for commerce. Aside from BTOP, however, the greatest challenge lies in completing other projects on time. Given the constrained budget environment, increased costs or loss of Recovery Act funding caused by schedule delays could put projects and the operations they support at serious risk. For example, our testimony discusses projects that NOAA itself identified as experiencing schedule challenges, including the construction of the NOAA ship Reuben Lasker, an $87 million project which has experienced significant delays and difficulties meeting performance requirements, and the construction of the La Jolla Southwest Science Center in California, an $85 million project which has also experienced delays, responsibility for which is currently a matter of dispute between the government and the contractor. At NIST, we are currently auditing the $179 million Recovery Act program, which awarded 16 construction grants, primarily for university research facilities, and believe there are four projects that are at some risk of not being completed by the new September 2013 deadline recently set by OMB. Finally, Mr. Chairman, based on our ongoing oversight and close interaction with the Department and its bureaus, we have seen improved oversight procedures and processes and evidence that the Department is being diligent about their responsibilities under the Act. As demonstrated by our July 2011 findings concerning recipient reporting, the Act has resulted in more diligent oversight by program offices and greater executive level involvement than we have seen in the past. In our view, the emphasis on transparency and accountability has been a significant benefit of the Recovery Act. Going forward, a challenge will be to institutionalize that emphasis on transparency and accountability for all spending carried out by the Department, and we look forward to working with the Department and Congress in doing so. This concludes my statement, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Zinzer. Now the Chairman recognizes Ms. Lerner for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Tonko, and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate this opportunity to provide an update of my office's continuing efforts to monitor the $3 billion in Recovery Act funds provided to the National Science Foundation. Our approach to error oversight has consisted of two phases a proactive phase for risk mitigation activities that was accomplished primarily during the funding stage to help prevent problems and prepare for more substantive work, and an operational phase during which we plan to undertake more traditional audits, investigations, and other types of reviews. During the proactive phase, we conducted real-time reviews of NSF's error-related activities that resulted in several recommendations to NSF management our work during this phase included identifying potential high-risk error risk awardees and recommending ways to make NSF's award process more accountable and transparent. We also conducted a series of reviews of universities and nonprofit organizations that received ERA funds to determine at an early stage whether those institutions had the financial capability to manage Recovery Act funding and how well those organizations were complying with the Act's quarterly reporting requirements. With respect to financial capability, we concluded that in general the entities we examined had established adequate internal controls to ensure that ERA funds were properly segregated as required. With regard to data quality, we found that while the institutions we reviewed had generally established uh, appropriate processes, there were several areas in which NSF recipients were not consistently, accurately, or completely reporting data. 
We made recommendations to NSF to promote consistent and accurate reporting, and the agency generally agreed with those recommendations. The error recipients we reviewed also indicated that they were taking action to improve their reporting. Oh. Sorry. In the operational phase, among other things, we are planning to audit specific error awards at recipient, insti at recipient institutions. In determining, in determining which awards to audit, we will conduct a risk assessment which takes into consideration variables such as award type, the results of prior audits, and error specific issues such as the total number and dollar value of Recovery Act awards. Mr. Chairman, because of the large amounts of error funding they received, the complexity of the projects and the management challenges inherent in construction projects, we have directed significant oversight to NSF's construction of three major projects, the Alaska Region Research Vessel, the Ocean Observatories Initiative, or OOI, and the Advanced Technology Solar Telescope, or ATST. I'll conclude my testimony by focusing on problems uncovered in audits of OOI and ATSD and the impact of those problems on Recovery Act funds. We began this oversight activity with, with audits of the cost proposals for OOI, which had total projected cost of $386 million with $106 million in ERA funds, and for ATST, which had total projected cost of $298 million with $146 million in ERA funds. We reviewed these proposals because they're the basis on which recipients can draw down funds over the course of their, their awards. The resulting audits performed on our behalf by the Defense Contract Audit Agency disclosed significant problems with the use and management of contingency funds. NSF requires awardees to include contingency estimates in the budgets of construction projects to ensure that actual costs do not exceed planned costs. The auditors found that the $150 million in contingencies in the two cost proposals are not allowable under federal cost principles, which state that contingencies for events, the occurrence of which cannot be foretold with certainty as to time, intensity, or with an assurance that they're happening, are unallowable. The question amount includes $55 million in ERA funding. The auditors were also troubled by the lack of controls over the contingency funds. NSF allows contingency funds to be held by the awardee's project officer during the construction phase. The auditors found that the awardees can draw down contingency funds without prior NSF approval at any point in the project, and that there are no technical barriers to prevent these, prevent these funds from being used for purposes other than contingencies. As a result, there is an increased risk of fraud or misuse of these funds. We've recommended that NSF require awardees to remove the allowable contingencies from their proposed budgets, and that NSF, not awardees, control the release of contingency funds. We're working with NSF management to resolve these and other contingency findings, and because of the large dollar amounts and the risk posed by NSF's current process of funding contingencies, we'll begin work this year to examine the use of ERA funds for contingencies in the construction of the Alaska Region Research Vessel. This concludes my statement, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Warner. <clears throat> now I recognize Ms. Robinson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the, you and the members of the subcommittee for inviting us here today. NASA received $1 billion in Direct Recovery Act funding, the bulk of which it dedicated to ongoing projects in earth science, astrophysics, exploration, and aeronautics research. For example, the James Webb Space Telescope received an infusion of $75 million, the multipurpose crew vehicle, $166 million, and the mobile launcher, $25 million, while $24.4 million was used to fund contracts in the Small Business Innovative Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Programs. In addition, NASA used $50 million to repair facilities at the Johnson Space Center that had been damaged by Hurricane Ike in 2008. Uh, as has already pointed out, and in contrast to some of the other agencies, NASA has obligated and, in fact, dispersed virtually all of this, these funds. Since passage of the Act, the OIG has actively monitored NASA's Recovery Act efforts through both our audit and investigative work. On the audit side, we've issued seven products, including reports examining the agency's use of funds for the James Webb Telescope, for three Earth science missions, and for the Johnson Hurricane, hurricane Repair work. We also have five audits currently in progress. Overall, we found that NASA generally used Recovery Act funds in accordance with the requirements and goals of the Act and OMB's implementing guidance. However, we also made more than $2 million in monetary findings and identified several internal control weaknesses in NASA's processes, including unauthorized persons recommending payment of invoices, poor negotiation of project oversight costs, 
and incomplete contract files. We made eight recommendations to improve NASA's internal controls. The agency agreed with all of our recommendations, and five of them have been closed. The agency continues to work to address the remaining three. In addition to our audit work, we currently have seven open investigations relating to the Recovery Act. One is a proactive effort involving SBIR and SBTT contracts. Three involve allegations of companies submitting false information, and one involves a possible conflict of interest and misappropriation of funds by a former NASA employee. We also have an active investigation involving procurement irregularities and a case in which an individual has been indicted for stealing copper from a project funded with Recovery Act money. In addition to these ongoing matters, we recently closed two cases as unsubstantiated, and we referred two other issues to NASA managers for their disposition. As NASA's Recovery Act efforts wind down, the OIG will continue to conduct audits, reviews, and investigations to ensure compliance with the Act's mandates. This concludes my oral statement, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. I want to thank all y'all. By the way, that's Southern for, it's plural for y'all, but uh, I want to thank all y'all for your testimony. Reminding members that committee rules limit members' questioning to five minutes per round of questions, the chair at this point will open the round of questions, and I'll recognize myself for five minutes. To, the, um, to Mr. Friedman, a lot of attention has been paid to the loan guarantees to Solyndra and Beacon Power because of their bankruptcies. Beacon Power also received funding from DOE's Energy Delivery and Energy Reliability Program, the Office of Science and RPE. What happens to the grant money when companies go bankrupt? And does the company keep it? Does the agency keep it? Or does it go back to the Treasury? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I frankly am not personally familiar with the specific terms in the non-loan uh, guarantee uh, expenditures that the Department made with regard to, to Beacon. So I, I can't give you a definitive answer. However, in general, depending upon the nature of the agreement, uh, they are either time payments based on completion of various aspects of, of goals of the, of the project, or there is a payment up front. If, in fact, the entity is, is, is bankrupt and they are they're cashless, if that's the case, then obviously the, if the money has been expended, it, it can no longer be recovered. If, on the other hand, it has not been dispersed, uh, my assumption would be there would be a hold placed on those, on those funds until the bankruptcy is resolved. Well, the assets, that's an assumption on my part, Mr. Sure. Chairman. I'm not positive. Well, the assets should have value, though. So where does the taxpayers' interests fit within the bankruptcy proceedings? Well, I, Can we I'm, recover those funds? I'm, I'm not intimately familiar with the, the way the Department is proceeding. I, I've seen the public reports on uh, sale of assets and, and, and the Department's interest in those assets. I don't know how that intersects with the funds other than the loan guarantee funds that have been expended with, with Beacon. Okay. To all y'all, if a recipient is unable to spend its uh, ARA funding prior to the OMB deadline of September 30th, 2013. What happens to that money? Does the agency keep it? Does it go back to the Treasury? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's entirely unclear from the OMB guidance what exactly is going to happen, but there's also uh, the factor of the Dodd-Frank legislation that included some provisions about uh, uh, unobligated and unspent a Recovery Act money, I think our sense would be that uh, the money would go back to the Treasury. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Mr. Esco? I think in general we agree that, that uh, the, the, um, our, our reading of it is that uh, it will go back to the Treasury, although for, specific, for, for grants that are um, not expended, but at that point at, at, for specific ones, um, there may be some conditions that, that, that where the OMB guidance is unclear, in which case that would have to be resolved. All right. Ms. Robinson, in your testimony, you stated that the $75 million in ARA funding that NASA received for the beleaguered James Webb Space Telescope enabled 454 jobs to be retained on the JWST project in the fourth quarter of FY 2009 and 149 jobs in the first quarter of FY 10. I'm familiar with jobs created and the attempt to quantify 
jobs saved. Is jobs enabled mentioned as a criterion in the act or in OMB guidelines? I, I don't know, sir, if exactly what, um, what they use in, in the OMB guidelines. I do know that um, the James Webb Telescope Project was going to run out of money um, in, to, in that year, in fiscal year 2009, and that they used that money uh, to continue work, which enabled the, uh, primarily the contract personnel to continue that work in that period. All right. Uh, JWST was initially expected to cost $1 billion in and to launch in 2008. It has now ballooned to almost $9 billion and is expected to, la to launch in 2018. Should cost overruns be considered an economic stimulus? <laughs> Again, I, I, I don't think cost overruns are an economic stimulus. As we're all aware, the program has in, uh, repeatedly um, been over schedule and over budget. Um, and, and Congress and NASA and the administration have worked hard to give them the additional money they need to, to finally bring it to fruition. Okay, and are these jobs enabled contractors that flow from project to project? Or are there federal employees that are part of a standing workforce that are there at NASA Center? I believe with regard to the telescope, they were primarily contractor in, uh, employees. Okay, my time has expired, and I recognize my ranking member, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> While the uh, Solyndra story has preoccupied many, the real story on DOE's loan guarantee program is not about one company going under, but about the department holding tens of billions of dollars in loans, all of which carry risk. Uh, from my experience in New York State, I can attest that nuclear projects are among the most expensive and sometimes most risky. I'm not alone in that opinion. In a 2003 study, CBO put the risk of default for nuclear loans at, quote, well above 50 percent. The key factor they wrote <clears throat> is, quote, accounting for this risk is that we expect that the plant would be une uneconomic to operate because of its high construction costs relative to other electricity generation sources. Nothing has changed on that score since 2003. A new report by CBO cites a study that found, quote, uh, of the 117, 117 privately owned plants in the United States that were started in the 60s and 70s, and for which data are available, 48 were canceled, and almost all of them experienced significant cost overruns. Uh, the Solyndra loan is dwarfed by just one of the nuclear project loans that DOE has approved. The first approved loan is for over $8 billion to the Southern Company. That single loan is roughly 16 times the size of the Solyndra loan. So, Mr. Rusco, I would ask, uh, according to the July 2010 report from the Department of Energy, which treats new, uh, or, or on, G, uh, on the Department of Energy by GAO. Oh, well, on the Department of Energy by GAO. Uh, treats nuclear loans differently than other types of applicants. Can you describe the treatment that these loans that the loan applicants receive and shed light for us on why there was that difference? Well, uh, first of all, there's a difference between the, the Recovery Act loans and, and the, the uh, 1703 loans, and, and the nuke loans were, were um, conditionally committed to under the uh, 1703 program, so that in that program, uh, the the companies themselves will be paying their credit subsidy cost. Um, but that, that's just to clarify that that's, that's not a, a Recovery Act. Um, those aren't Recovery Act loans. And that money has not yet gone out the door um, and is awaiting license, licenses. Um, what we found is that in the application process that the the nuke loans and some of the larger fossil loans were, were able to essentially skip some steps in the application process and were reached conditional commitment prior to having completed all those steps. And we felt that that was inconsistent with the, with the guidance and the rules of, as set out by the, by the program. The explanation by the program for that was that um, more is known about, about these types of projects and, and therefore they're, they were able to uh, skip those. But w we didn't feel the documentation for, th for that justification was sufficient. Right. 
But as I understand it, these um, loans were brought under the ARRA in terms of employment reporting requirements, were they not? And there is absolutely no difference in how the Department of Energy handles those loans? Um, well, the basic loan process differs in the sense that for the, uh, for the 1703 programs, the government won't be picking up the, the um, uh, credit subsidy costs, which will, sh will be very significant for the nuclear loans. Mm -hmm. Given the favorable way that nuclear applicants were treated, is there any assurance you can provide this panel that DOE is being as tough on reexamining the nuclear loan exposures they are in looking at everything else? Uh, perhaps Mr. Risco or Mr. Friedman, can you give us those assurances in this case? GAO has broad concerns about the the slow speed at which the the loan program has uh, codified and made consistent its application review process and its due diligence process, and and so we're we are concerned about all loans that 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 may or may not have gone through uh, all the steps of the, of the process. And we think that, the, that if the program will more clearly document what they're doing and their reasons for deviating from their process, there will be greater transparency and we'll be more comfortable. Mr. Friedman, would you have anything to add to that or do you agree with that? Uh, I uh, agree. I don't have any information on it. I can't give you any assurance because obviously that's not within my, within my purview. But we issued a report in March of this year concerning the very issues that uh, you've just heard about, which is basically the, the level of documentation uh, with regard to identification of risks and the mitigation of those risks and how they've been addressed and, and the lack of documentation and inadequate documentation. Uh, so obviously we agree, and it, it, it covers the entire portfolio of, of loan, loan guarantees in terms of uh, the ability of the department in the event of a crisis to identify why they took the actions that they took. So we, we do agree. Mm -hmm. And finally, if we can get some info on and the funds that are obligated but uncommitted, um, spent, what leverage do the agencies have to push recipients of awards to spend these funds? Is there any, anyone on the panel that, or, or all of you that might want to address how we could get those monies spent? Sir, I think it is a function of the program office that's overseeing those uh, projects, either whether it's a grant or a contract, to make sure that the grantee is uh, uh, remaining on schedule. Uh, beyond that, I think you have to draw a balance between pushing the grantees or contractors to spend the money quickly and making sure that the money is spent e effectively. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, and I'd like to re remind my friend New York, there is a huge difference between Southern Company and Solyndra between the technology of nuclear energy as well as what Solyndra is trying to do. So the risk of the loan to Southern Company or any other nuclear power company is, is vastly different than loaning, lending money to a company like Solyndra, particularly with all the, the warnings that came from the previous administration as well as this administration. Uh, now I recognize Dr. Bouchon for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all the uh, panelists here today. Uh, when we passed the stimulus bill, um, I wasn't here, but uh, uh, it was promised that the unemployment rate would be below 8 percent and drop down. So my questions are going to be related to similar to that process. Because as everyone knows, we, have, we now have a persistent over 9 percent unemployment rate and the economy is still sluggish. It appears to me, not being in Congress at the time, that, that everyone uh, that received money had to scramble to find uses for the money and then retrospectively assess whether or not it was, it was used properly or, more importantly, has resulted in long-term improvement and changes that are necessary to decrease our over 9 percent unemployment. It seems to me that that's backward the way we should be thinking about this process. So uh, I'll make the assumption that all the departments represented here will take extra money if it's offered to them. Uh, but the question I have, and I guess I would direct it to uh, Mr. Friedman first as it relates to the Department of Energy. Uh, did the Department of Energy request the money? Did they need the money? Or in your view, did the Department of Energy have to find, per find ways to spend the money once it was out there? Well, I'm not sure I have a good answer to your question, but I, let me 
in March of, uh, of 2009, we issued a report. Um, We issued a report concerning lessons learned on our prior work in, in this regard, uh, Congressman. And at that point, uh, it, cl it was clear that the, the, the Recovery Act, with regard to the Department of Energy, had, had three purposes. One is economic uh, a stimulus, two is job creation, and three was transformation of the department. So I think there was a, a clear understanding on the part of both the, the Congress at the time and those who voted for the legislation and the administration that the funds would be used for that purpose as well, transforming the Department of Energy, focusing on, on green, uh, going green, uh, renewables, and, and what have you in the technology area. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Dr. Mr. Jens Zinzer. Yes, so uh, we're not part of the inner circle of the, uh, of the department, so we didn't have a lot of insight on how the uh, requests were formulated, but really there were two things. I think some were pent-up budget requests that had not been funded in previous years. And then in the case of the Department of Commerce, for example, you had an entire $5 billion program thus thrust upon a small agency that wasn't uh, properly staffed to administer a program like that. So I think it was a combination of uh, both of those. Ms. Lerner? Thank you. And, and I would echo um, what Mr. Zinzer said um, and, and further it by the fact that I was not at NSF in February of 2009 when the Stimulus Act was packed. So I, I'm not aware of what role the agency had in the ultimate three, uh, three, in the determining of the $3 billion that the agency got. But I do know that NSF has wanted to boost the acceptance rate um, for people that they fund um, over time, and, and they, were, they were excited that the $3 billion would enable enable them to fund more scientific research. Um, Two-thirds of the funding that they received they used to fund proposals that they had in hand that had been rated well. Um, but uh, So I, I think they were prepared to move pretty quickly and execute the, the funding that they received. And, and they were able to build the acceptance rate, and that helps them, as I said, um, ensure that more basic scientific research is done and that the science and technology workforce of the future is trained. Ms. Robinson. I also was not at NASA in uh, 2009 when the act was passed, so I do not know uh, what role the agency played in uh, how much money they were going to get. Um, again, they, did, they, they got the smallest amount of the people here. They did do a lot up front to make sure that they were going to use it appropriately and that they were going to uh, meet the transparency and other requirements of the act. I guess my line of question is just meant to establish the fact that that uh, it seems to me that a bunch of federal funding was thrust upon uh, these different uh, agencies, and then uh, they had to scramble to find out how to use it, and in many cases did not not even have the infrastructure in place to appropriately uh, implement uh, whatever programs it was supposed to benefit. and. Uh, uh, being a new member of Congress, that just seems uh, backwards to me and the way we, we uh, allocate money at the federal government. And uh, again, I think that the, um, the proof is in the results. Uh, we still have an over 9 percent unemployment rate, and now we have almost $800 billion more on the federal deficit. Uh, and uh, the entire intent of the stimulus was to uh, get people back to work. And I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bichon. Uh, now recognize Mr. McNerney for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the things that I really uh, have uh, uh, found useful in this set of testimonies is that the, uh, the increase in transparency and accountability has been caused by the American, uh, by the AARA, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, but moving forward, um, Mr. Russo in particular, do you believe that those checks uh, and balances have made a difference in reducing waste and abuse and fraud? Uh, yes, I'm certain that, that the oversight, the, the extra oversight that, that we and the IGs and, 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 and the other uh, uh, bodies um, were um, giving this have, have reduced that. There, there has been fraud, waste, and, and abuse found, but uh, the, the added oversight has also made the agencies more careful and 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 also uh, created better processes for uh, performing their own oversight. Well, good. Do you think those processes will be 
in place moving forward into non-AARA expenditures? I hope so. I do too. <laughs> well, that's, that's going to be something we're going to be watching, I guess. Um, Mr. Wood, I, I found your uh, testimony very informative. Um, and I want to congratulate you and the RIT board for the excellent work you've done uh, in, in toward creating transparency. I'm sure there's room for improvement uh, as we go forward, uh, but um, there are costs associated with this improvement in transparency uh, reporting and so on. Uh, do you have any insights as to whether the enhanced transparency is worth the cost that went into developing those processes? Uh, I, I, my position would be that it, that it was worth the cost. Um, we established a system where recipients needed to report information, uh, and they did. We tried to establish systems that were very easy to use. Um, when I built the reporting system, uh, I basically told people, if you can order a book online, you can use uh, the reporting system, which is fairly true. It's a web-based system. Uh, there can be improvements made. We can incorporate uh, <coughs> things such as pre-population of some of the data so that the recipient wouldn't have to add that information. Um, I know the Data Act includes a provision for um, providing some administrative overhead. I think it's 0.5 percent for recipients to use for things like reporting and so forth. So there's some things that could be improved. We looked at um, one of the concerns was reporting burden when we were um, uh, getting going and, and, and looking at the Recovery Act. I think the Recovery Act and the Transparency Act for FADA, its predecessor, both established a sort of a floor of $25,000. So if you received $25,000 or more, you had to report. Uh, that's an area you could look at for if you're concerned about reporting burden on small uh, entities and so forth. Um, Mr. Russo, again, uh, one of the things that I was disappointed to hear was that you were unable to uh, assess the employment impact of the ARRA. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Was that your position? Um, well, not exactly. We, the GAO has not uh, set out to um, evaluate ourselves what the job creation uh, effects have been. We've looked at what has been reported and we've also looked at some of the efforts in particular in the environmental, environmental management um, office of DOE and we found that the methodologies used by that office um, were not in, uh, conforming to OMB guidance, and, and they, they were, uh, in some cases, clearly overcounting, in some cases, perhaps even undercounting. Is there, is there anyone on the panel here this morning that could answer that question about the impact of the ARRA funding on employment uh, in your particular department? Sir, I think the uh, the goal of calculating and tracking uh, job creation was um, very ambitious, and in the end, it didn't it didn't turn out to be very feasible because of the movement of the jobs. You can have jobs created and go away. You can have jobs that trans uh, over from one reporting period to another. So, at the end of the end of the day, what you have is the jobs created in a particular quarter and those jobs aren't cumulative. So when you go on to the recovery.gov website and look at jobs created, it's just for that most current quarter. Well, uh, you know, the, the improvement in accountability and transparency is terrific. It'd be good to have an improvement in terms of being able to assess the impact of this funding on, on employment. Uh, with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. McNerney. Uh, now recognize Ms. Adams for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Rusko, your testimony notes that DOE has only implemented two of your eight recommendations concerning weatherization programs that receive $5 billion in stimulus funds. Have any independently verified studies been conducted to see what energy savings have occurred as a result of this program? Um, the, there is a study being done um, by Oak Ridge uh, National Lab, and they have some preliminary results, but they're also um, in a I think two years going to have uh, more definitive results of that that study. So there's one independent to your knowledge. Yes. 
and the $5 billion stimulus funds given to weatherization programs is more than 20 times as much as programs was previously appropriated. Such huge increases can lead to a number of challenges for any agency that sees such an increase. Can you discuss some of the challenges faced by DOE due to the increase and what lessons can be learned from this experience and how can they be applied to other programs? Well, I think some of the, some of the main challenges were uh, related to ramping up both at the department but also at the recipient level. So the recipients were not used to uh, receiving as much funds as were, were available under the Recovery Act. And some recipients had received hardly any funds in, in the past. And so for them to set up the accountability structure and to set up the training uh, systems and the reporting systems and to get guidance from, from DOE took time. And that, those, those are sort of just the basic, the basic challenges of setting up something that was run at a much smaller scale. Thank you. Mr. Zeisner, right? Zinsner? Um, your testimony notes a referral from the Recovery Board that led to an investigation, led to an investigation about a company that had previously pled guilty to a criminal charge concerning export regulations. This company then falsely certified that it had not been convicted of a crime in order to receive the stimulus funding. Which, which company is this and why did, it even, why did they even receive the stimulus funds in the first place with the Recovery Board's data system in place? Congresswoman, I, the name of the company itself, I believe, is um, MTS, and it does do a lot of work with the uh, government. And I think what happened is that when it was convicted in 2008, uh, nobody made the effort to get it onto the government's excluded list. And so when um, they started competing for contracts, there's some ambiguity whether that particular conviction met the excluded issues on the uh, on the form. I can't remember the name of the form, but these contractors fill out a form. So they uh, they said no based on advice of their counsel. So that ambu ambiguity from their side. What about your side? Well, we're continuing. They, they we referred them for uh, suspension and debarment from government contracting. And they have entered into a, an agreement with the government uh, to have their operations monitored by an independent third party. And their conduct that we, uh, in, that we found is currently uh, being investigated for any potential judicial action. So in, instead of being disbarred, they've entered into a corporate compliance agreement and therefore continuing to operate. Would you support disbarring them? We did support disbarring them, yes. Ms. Robinson, your testimony mentions inflated overhead costs for hurricane damage repair at the Johnson Space Center. Is NASA making any effort to recoup this money from the contractor? NASA could not recoup the money from the contractor. It was a fixed price contract and um, amounts that they had agreed to pay. Your testimony, um, you know, is generally positive concerning NASA's stimulus expenditures. Is that because these funds were primarily directed towards existing programs? Or was NASA better able to manage the funds, the funding increase over other agencies? I think it was probably a combination of the fact that it was existing programs and that the agency took um, steps proactively to make sure that they had set up systems uh, to ensure the proper use of the money. Mr. Zeisner, uh, you said uh, in an answer earlier that it was an ambitious goal to track the employment or the lack of employment uh, based on these funds. Do you think it's possible at all to truly know if it did or did not help unemployment? Because the, the numbers show that we're well over 8 percent. So if I'm going by what I see every day in my communities, I would say no, it did not help. If you go back to the beginning of the Act, there were two different tracks that were set up. One was uh, set up by the Council of Economic Advisors where they were going to determine what the uh, impact of the act had been on employment. The other tract was the, this idea of recipients reporting the jobs created. My answer uh, previously de dealt with that second track, uh, trying to count the number of jobs created and the problems you run into are... Well, let me ask you this. Would you agree that unemployment is higher today than it was when this was passed? 
Uh, based on my reading of the economic statistics, I would say that the unemployment rate is higher today Thank than you. it was then. I yield back. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Adams. Uh, now I recognize Mr. Holkren for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all very much. This is important uh, for us to be discussing, and, and the American people want accountability. Uh, they want results uh, that really make a difference and, and get things rolling again. So I think this is an important discussion to be having today. So thank you for uh, the work that you're doing and for your uh, role being here today. It appears to me that money spent on and, and channeled through the national labs was money that was much better spent than these apparently rushed loan guarantees and economic interventions that we saw. Uh, Mr. Friedman, I wanted to address a question to you and wondered if you could speak to what efforts and formal studies DOE has conducted to assess um, and properly weigh the relative merits of funding to the labs versus other recipients. Uh, Fermilab is, a, uh, is located in my district and, and they do cutting edge work that really is important and given how hard it has been for DOE to find even modest additional funding for the lab. Uh, this question is very important to me, so I wonder if, if you could shed some light on that. For well, if, if you're asking uh, whether the, the department has uh, uh, done such a study, uh, I, I'm not aware of one, and there may well have. But what, what we have found, both in terms of uh, the, the science funds and in terms of the environmental remediation funds that the department received, which were significant, that the work done in pre-existing programs and advancing pre-existing programs at the national laboratories actually worked, uh, worked quite well. The requirements of the Recovery Act appear to have been followed. There was a fairly expeditious expenditure of the funds. Uh, they, they, uh, they did hire people, in fact, and they've completed the project. They've, they've, they've applied reasonably good project management uh, skills to those, to those funds. Okay. Well, again, thank you all for being here. I appreciate the work that you're doing in this important discussion. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hawker. And we'll endeavor to do a second round of questioning. And I recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Lerner and Ms. Robinson, are there lessons learned from the Recovery Act SBR funding that can be translated to overall SBR programs at agencies that are so troubled by waste, fraud, and abuse? Whichever one wants to start. Uh, we, be we believe there are. We're actually doing an um, ongoing audit at the moment um, that's looking at the um, agency's Recovery Act, SBIR, STRR work, and we haven't quite completed it yet, but we do believe that there will be some uh, actions that the agency took during, for the Recovery Act that would be applicable and recommended uh, to apply to their other programs as well, non-Recovery Act. Ms. Lerner. I would note that the, the greater access to data about SBIR and STTR programs that was provided through the, the reported data and the Stimulus Act was useful in trying to work those types of cases. Um, one of the challenges agencies have had has been the, the quality of data of, about projects, SBIR and STTR fund, projects that have been funded, and there have been some improvements made to databases that the SBIR program is, is intended to maintain, but the additional data that uh, is available from the Recovery Act uh, is useful as well, and it makes it easier for agencies, particularly in cases where there's duplicate funding, to find opportunities to work together and to combat fraud in those programs. Very good. Mr. Rusko, in GAO's 2009 testimony, they mentioned that the Recovery Act made a $2.32 billion available to energy to jointly fund private sector projects demonstrating clean coal and carbon capture and sequestration technologies. FutureGen was the subject of considerable attention by this committee after the Bush administration decided to cancel the program citing cost overruns. In various reports and testimony, GEO found that DOE did not base its decision to restructure FutureGen on a comprehensive analysis of factors such as associated cost benefits and risk. Did DOE ever conduct the recommended analysis prior to awarding over $1 billion in stimulus funding to the project? Uh, beyond the point at which we last testified and reported, we have not looked at that program, but I'm unaware of, of, of such a study at this point. So the answer is no. Recently, um, Amarin, the owner of the power plant, announced their intent to close down the site to comply with EPA regulations. 
leaving the restructured FutureGen project once more in limbo. What implications do this announcement have on the future of the project? Again, we haven't looked at it recently, but um, I, you know, obviously, uh, that program has has been troubled by by a number of things, including uh, the fact that, in our view, they haven't really uh, reconciled the purpose of the program with what industry is willing and able to do, and I think that that, that needs to be uh, further looked into. Okay, what is this? current status of the billion dollars in stimulus funding and what impact do you anticipate the future announcement will have on the overall cost of future gen and if future gen does not move forward what will happen to that obligated funding yeah I'm sorry I, I can't answer that at this point but um, I could look into that and see if I can answer it for the record okay mr. Freeman do you have any comment can you answer that no I, I can't elaborate on what's been said already mr. chairman okay to all y'all um, to start with, uh, RATB, um, Mr. Wood, what oversight body is responsible for ensuring that the goals of the stimulus bill were met and who's looking at whether outcome-based metrics are being evaluated? Um, the, the recovery board is, um, does coordination of the accountability uh, mainly for waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, and um, passes out if we if we find information such as was was um, discussed earlier we will refer it to the inspectors general for investigation I think on the on the performance metrics um, th that's an area that uh, was not stressed in the recovery act we did publish the uh, program plans for each agency that won't be required and, the, and that the guidance required um, but if you look at if you look at performance metrics per se, it's probably a, a one of the weaker areas of the act. We can track the dollars, uh, we do collect information on the jobs, but the performance metrics is probably uh, not an area where we specifically collect information. Anybody else want to weigh in? <clears throat> yeah, Mr. Chairman, in the case of NOAA, for example, on their habitat restoration, they they received about 150 million dollars for habitat restoration. They've actually established a website that identifies where those projects are located. And you go to that website and you can click on the map and they'll, they'll actually give you the uh, performance of that grant uh, recipients with respect to that project right there on their website. It's called uh, restoration.noaa.gov, I think. Is this, uh, you cited one instance, is, but we're spending billions of dollars here. Is this just one instance out of of uh, all of the stimulus funding, or is it pretty pervasive across the the whole gamut of, of stimulus expenditures? Recovery.gov does give a lot of information about individual projects that you can go and uh, and look at and uh, analyze. Uh, whether they're all outcome measures or not, I'm not so sure. I think a lot of them are output measures, uh, but I think for the most part, uh, the key outcome is economic stimulus and, and I, I think I've testified about the, the difficulties in calculating job created. Thank you. My time has expired. Mr. Tonka, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let me congratulate all of you for the work that you've done to enhance the public's ability to see where its money goes. It also um, is important, I think, to thank you for all the work done to raise uh, your own effort to bring accountability to the um, ARRA program. Uh, the transparency of ARA is wonderful, but it does come at a cost, as was earlier stated by Representative McNerney. I'd like to uh, delve into that a little deeper. Agencies have obviously more burdens associated with working with fund recipients and collecting data. And the IGs and the RAT board have burdens for spot checking, reporting, compliance, and in aggregating data before making them available to the public. Perhaps most importantly, recipients of funds have costs in complying with reporting requirements and tracking where those funds specifically go. Now, members and staff had, have heard complaints over the last two years from colleges, from universities, from small businesses that that reporting is indeed onerous and confusing. Now, I'm very supportive of making government funding as transparent as possible for our public. However, it 
it's to be stated that we don't want it to see to, to have it serve as an unnecessary burden uh, onto agencies or small businesses and universities. So to our witnesses, I would like you to share your thoughts about how we can apply the lessons learned with ARA to make government funding more transparent while not overburdening funding agencies and recipients. Just like, could you address what you believe is the right balance and should we perhaps establish a dollar value uh, which uh, would then kick in for um, further scrutiny or reporting requirements. Uh, perhaps, Mr. Wood, we can start with you and then have the entire panel address that. Yeah, and I think I, I mentioned earlier this is an excellent question. Um, we tried to build our reporting systems to be uh, as least burdensome as possible. There are some things I think we could do. Uh, you've mentioned some of them. Uh, one thing you could look at is raising the, the, the floor from $25,000 to a higher level. You'd lose some granularity in the information you collect, but uh, uh, it would probably alleviate some of the small business concerns and so forth. Um, there's some things we could do technologically, and we have done. Uh, for instance, we installed edit checks and so forth to um, prevent people from making common mistakes, putting in the wrong zip code with a, putting in New Hampshire zip code with Nevada and so forth. Um, so there's things we can do along those lines. Um, I think the other thing we did in the, in the Recovery Act that was effective is we actually limited it to 99 data elements. That sounds like a lot, but uh, that's a limited data set for some of the things the federal government does. I think you could even look at reducing the number of data elements, some, uh, making sure that you really were collecting exactly what you wanted. Uh, and you could do some pre-population of those data elements. You could use existing uh, government systems that might have information in them to pre-populate it. So even though there were data elements that needed to be reported, uh, it wasn't burdensome for the, for the person filing the report. Mm -hmm. Mr. Roscoe? I think improved guidance from programming agencies would help and and that was one of the big challenges getting that guidance to be clear and and timely was a challenge and, and hopefully that's also a lesson lear learned going forward mm -hmm. mr. Friedman well of course you, you've uh, hit mr. Uh, Tonko on one of the really important questions that have com come out of this and I appreciate that uh, look I, I think uh, we need a risk-based strategy we need thresholds that make sense and that's one of the lessons that I think we've learned. We heard the same thing from recipients that you are alluding to, which is that they felt the reporting requirements were overly burdensome and, and not necessarily productive, and we agree with that. I, I would just one note of caution, though, that if, if the body politic is prepared to accept the thresholds and understand the risks associated with accepting those thresholds and no reporting below the threshold or limited reporting, that would be okay. But if, if on the other hand, at the end of the day, we're going to, adopt such a, a mechanism and then have people criticize the fact that there wasn't reporting and there wasn't adequate oversight below those thresholds, we will have actually ended up, I think, uh, moving the ball backwards rather than moving the ball forward. I, I don't know if that makes any sense. I'm hoping to address your question. I think that the, the several members of the, of the subcommittee have hit on some extremely important points with regard to lessons learned and best practices. And, if we've spent three quarters of a billion dollars or eight hundred uh, million dollars on the Stimulus Act, and if we haven't learned, both in the IG community, in the program part of our agencies, and frankly the Congress, if I may say so, if we haven't learned a lot, then uh, shame on uh, shame on all of us. Thank you, Mr. Sensor. Well, Mr. Wood knows better than anybody um, about the development of federalreporting.gov. Uh, er early on, I think, the RAP Board thought that they would just use existing financial systems to go and grab the information from the grantees and contractors using existing financial systems. But when you plotted out the labyrinth of those systems, it was going to take years and if ever to develop something like that. So they came up with this federalreporting.gov system. And I think the legislation that Mike referred to is intended to try to institutionalize that for all government spending, and we think that would be a good idea. One of the problems with that, I believe, was that that system was kind of layered over existing reporting systems. There were a lot of complaints early on. We've been through nine quarters of reporting now, and I think the complaints have subsided. And I think that the data that you're getting uh, from the recipients it has a high quality. All the IGs have done audits of the data quality, so the data is better, 
And I think if we were able to get rid of some of the legacy systems in place of this federal reporting.gov type reporting to be a good thing. Thank you. Ms. Lerner? I would concur with what Mr. Zinzer said. I think I certainly have heard a lot of complaints about the burden, especially in the early days of this from uh, NSF recipients. And I, you know, I, I have some sympathy with that. Um, but I think part of the problem, part of the reason people feel overburdened is because they have to report data not just to the recovery board, but to multiple other sources for the federal government. And moving forward, I think if we could get to a point where we could combine many of those sources, which often require overlapping data, um, we would, we would achieve some cost savings because we wouldn't be separately maintaining dozens of different reporting systems, just a single one. We'd have improved accountability because people would know to go to one, it'd be one-stop shopping for data, and hopefully in a situation like that, we could, we, we could expand on the data collected in a way that would provide more useful information to people like me and people like you for oversight purposes at a, a, at a lesser burden on, on the recipients. Thank you. And finally, Ms. Robinson? I don't really have anything to add to that. I think it's, it's pretty much all been. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. <laughs> well, I want to have a, a lot of leeway here, and I'm not going to run things real tight, particularly when we're looking into an issue such as oversight and transparency and accountability. To me, the, the good thing that's come out of the Stimulus Act is that we, I think we do have more transparency and accountability for federal um, spending. We've certainly identified some problems in regard to trying to pour out masses of amount of money, almost a trillion dollars, and um, I respectfully disagree with my friend from New York about the success of the Stimulus Act. I think it's been... You can't pour almost a trillion dollars in the economy without having some positive effects, but I think overall it's been an abject failure. And the metrics I use for determining that is we were promised by the President that if we pass the stimulus bill, and you and I both were here during that period of time, Mr. Tonka, that uh, our unemployment rate would not go above 8 percent. And it has steadily risen to over 10 percent in my district. Uh, it's over 10 percent. My state, it's over 10 percent today. So um, there are other ways, I think, that are better of stimulating the economy, and that's getting the tax burden and regulatory burden off of the private sector so that we can start creating jobs and start creating a strong economy. Having said that, I want to thank the witnesses for all being here and for y'all's valuable testimony. It's been very enlightening, and I appreciate y'all's hard work in that regard. And I thank the members for their very insightful questions, too. Members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for all y'all, and um, we ask that you respond in writing to those questions that will be submitted. The record will remain open for two additional weeks for additional comments or questions from the members. The witnesses are excused. Again, thank y'all so much for being here and for y'all's hard work in this issue. The hearing is now adjourned. What's that?